In this lesson, we'll discuss advanced timing and synchronization methods. So in this lesson, we'll learn how to uh, find appropriate methods for synchronizing multiple DAC tasks. Let's say that we want two measurements to correspond with each other. Uh, to do this, we're going to want the measurement of the generation task to start at the same exact time. To do that, we'll need precise clocks and timing. So in this section, we go over some of the basic terminology. Let's start with the definition of synchronization for DAC hardware. To relate signals to each other, we'll have to coordinate um, the acquired data with time. And so once we do that, we can then correlate the signals with each other because they both have a time base. To coordinate a task with time, we'll need to associate it with the clock. We'll then be able to have our precise trigger and have our task coordinated. The basic foundation of all synchronization methods is the clock. So a clock is just a periodic sequence of evenly spaced events. And on the slide right now is an example of a clock. And from this figure, we can see that uh, DAC devices derive many clocks from the same oscillator. For most applications, uh, we're probably just concerned with the sample clock noted here. Um, but we can also see that the analog input sample clock is a little different from the analog output clock, um, even though they are derived from the same base. You can also see that the convert clocks are also part of the circuit diagram, which is derived from the same oscillator. To make sure separate tasks use coordinated timing, uh, you can share a sample clock or derive other clocks based on the same timing signal. This is known as a reference clock. So basically, a reference clock is a way that you can build your own sampling rate. The derived clocks are then uh, multiplied or divided by certain values so that we then obtain clocks that are slower or faster than our reference clock. Again, the key thing to realize here is that we are deriving clocks from the oscillator. Um, so we have our oscillator and then we create these clocks by multiplying or dividing by certain values to obtain different clocks. We've talked about timing sources and clocks already in the course. Um, the common clocks that we'll be using to correlate tasks with time is the sample clock. Um, however, depending on your ADC, you will also need to be aware of the convert clock. Because on multiplex devices, uh, the convert clock is what directly causes the ADC conversions. Here are the four most common ways to synchronize devices uh, from simplest to the most complex. We'll be going over these a little bit more in the next section. So this is just a high level overview. But know that the first choice is only valid for use on a single device, um, such as analog input and analog output that are on the same device. The other choices can be used with multiple devices. Also note that the last two uh, methods aren't supported on all devices and that they do require a Maritzi or a PXI trigger line. In the next sections of this lesson, uh, we'll learn how to share start triggers, triggers and sample clocks, and finally triggers and reference clocks. And this just shows the range of our synchronization methods and kind of where they go from unsynchronized to synchronized. Um, so as you can see, simultaneous isn't exactly synchronized. Uh, because operations can be happening at the same time, but that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that they started at the same time. So you can't prove that the measurements are occurring at the exact same instant. First, we'll take a look at the simplest way to synchronize tasks on a single device, using a shared hardware trigger. So suppose we wanted to take simultaneous uh, analog input and analog output measurements. Would this block diagram, or this application, do the trick? The answer is actually no. The separation between the exact start times of the two tasks still depends on the software time delay uh, between the executions of those start task VIs, and that varies due to the OS clock. So in the next slide, we'll look behind the scenes of what's happening in this VI.
Let's look at the timing of the VI from the last slide. If you don't specify a trigger, the DACMX start task VI uses the default trigger, which will be start trigger. But if you notice, you'll see that the AI and AO have separate start triggers. The AI start trigger and AO start trigger come from uh, both of the DACMX start task VIs. And due to software timing, those start triggers can be hundreds of milliseconds off from one another. Also notice that the AI and AO clocks are based on different time bases. Because of this, the clock signals are out of phase. So what we can do is actually specify one of the start triggers to be the trigger for both the analog input and analog output. Using those same start trigger signals will synchronize the start time, but it won't change the phase alignment issue. From the last block dagger we used uh, both AI and AO tasks had different start task functions, and so they were basically creating their own start triggers. But now what we're doing is with the analog output task, we have a start digital edge, and we are referencing device one analog input start trigger, which is coming from the start DACMX task from the analog input task. So how, how all of this works while it's running is that the analog input task on the top um, configures everything, it's set, set up to have a start digital edge trigger so it has its own source, um, and then it sits there and waits for the merge error, right? And so while that is happening, they're running in parallel, so the analog output task on the bottom is setting up all this configuration. We have a start trigger as well, but we're pointing it to the start trigger that gets made in the analog input task by the start DACMX task VI. So uh, we get to the analog output task on the bottom, and we get to the uh, start DAC MX task. So everything's all configured. It will actually start running and pass the um, error wire up. But it, it'll be running, but it will only wait until it gets the trigger to actually acquire data. So then at the very top, we have all the errors merged together. Then we'll finally start the analog input task, which will create the analog input start trigger. Um, and it'll just sit there and wait until it receives its trigger source. And once it does, then everything will run together. In this exercise, we'll create different VIs using different triggering methods to simultaneously generate and measure analog signals. This is the solution walkthrough for exercise 8 1. So I've got our solutions opened up here, and we'll, we'll just walk through um, through the block diagrams and what they're doing. So this is the first one. If we look at the block deck, 
we can see that we're just synchronizing these two tasks together using a flat sequence structure and the uh, two start tasks. And these are producing finite samples. Um, and I have already hooked up the analog input uh, channel 2 of the 9215 to the analog output 2 channel on the 9263. So what we're doing here is generating a um, sine wave on the 9263 and then reading it in on the 9215. And if we, so I've got this channel set up correctly, this is to the 9215, which is the analog input, and then this is to the 9263 with the analog output. So if I run this, check this running, so one of the key things to note is that we see a drop off right here. We're not getting any signals. Um, so these two tasks aren't really synchronized together. So as we can see from these graphs, uh, the analog input task begins before the analog output. And then this causes the input signal to finish before all the output signals have been generated. So that's why we get this drop off at the very end, because we started way ahead of time and we didn't collect all the samples being generated by the analog output. So now we can open up our next VI. So if we go into the block diagram, So this is being um, triggered off of the start trigger that's created by this task. So this task will get ready and is going to wait on the start trigger that's automatically created under the hood with this VI. So because we haven't um, associated a trigger with it, it's just going to create its own start trigger. So this one will arm itself and sit there and wait for this start trigger to be created and flipped from this, this other task. So if we start this, we can see here we got the correct samples. Let's uh, start this guy again. And both times we got the correct samples. And it is exactly the same as the output graph. So, by specifying the start trigger for the analog input task to be the start trigger that's flipped for the analog output task, we can guarantee that both of these are going to start at the same exact time. So let's open up the last situation, which is uh, using the hardware trigger to trigger these tasks. So if we go into the block diagram, so this one, this uh, analog input task is going to sit there and wait until this one, the analog output task, is started from the hardware trigger. So I will start this and press the trigger and there it goes so both tasks started at the exact same time uh, this sine wave got generated beforehand because we're just you know we're just making this with the sine waveform vi and that's where we're outputting um, so it sat there waited for me to trigger it with our digital trigger here and then we read in what it output so the analog input task was configured to begin on the first edge of the analog output sample task. So the analog input task was configured to begin on the first edge of the analog output sample clock. Um, so this means that both the analog input and analog output tasks are going to start simultaneously.
after the analog, let's ask a question. So after the analog input and output are simultaneously started, is the acquisition and generation synchronized? So the answer to this is not necessarily. In this exercise, you explored the problems with using only software to trigger different tasks and compared those results with using a hardware trigger to start both tasks. To do this, you created VIs using different methods to simultaneously generate and measure analog signals. Specifically, we used the following methods. Relying on software to trigger tasks, using the start trigger to trigger tasks, and then finally using hardware trigger to trigger tasks. In this section, we'll explain what can occur when you don't share a clock. In the last exercise, we saw that sharing a harder trigger or the implicit analog output start trigger signal was better than software timing uh, and synchronizing measurements. But this might not be enough for higher precision applications. There might be a noticeable propagation delay of the start trigger, uh, and that all depends on the device. This delay might not be noticeable for slower signals. The master task is the, uh, in this case, it would have been the analog input task as it's sharing its trigger. And you can see that there's a bit of a delay from the uh, start trigger from the master and the start trigger as seen by the slave task, which would be the analog output task. You know, the start trigger is when we actually start collecting samples. Uh, our sample clocks are off. And so there's an initial delay or initial skew from the trigger propagation. And then there's another skew because of sample clock drift over time. This is the list of timing errors that we'll talk about in the next few slides. We mentioned a potential skew caused by the trigger propagation uh, when we sent a trigger from the master to the slave. Skew can also occur between channels. So the definition of skew is a propagation delay that is caused when a signal arrives at two places at different times. And this is affected by distance and impedance of signal paths. Jitter is the small variations in the period of a clock from sample to sample, as seen here. Uh, the jitter in the clock can make the sample look a little odd, each component uh, added to the clock's path adds additional jitter and then can make the sample clock less equal. Clock stability describes how well the clock frequency resists fluctuations. Uh, so these fluctuations can come from variances in the devices like vari variations in temperature, how um, old the clock is, supply voltage, shock, vibration, all sorts of things. Clock drift occurs when two instruments are acquiring data at different sample rates. Even though these two instruments are set for the same sample rate, so for example, two digitizers are acquiring at 100 megahertz. The real oscillators on each of these instruments are running at different rates, and therefore clock drift occurs. So basically, the whole idea is that since we're using two different devices and two different clocks, we can't really guarantee that both clocks are going to be running at the, the, the exact same rate. So one might have a few variations, so there will be some drift between the two clocks. In this next section, we'll discuss techniques to synchronize multiple devices. And these will take care of the limitations of the shared trigger synchronization method. Sharing clocks can fix the problem of drift between measurements and gives us the last of our synchronization requirements. So what are the requirements so far? They are 
use a hardware trigger to start. We need to start the slave task before the master task. And then we have to share clocks to avoid drift over time. And so far we've talked about sharing hardware triggers and a little about starting the slave before the master. Now let's talk about how to share these clocks. These methods all take care of the synchronization requirements we just mentioned. Not all hardware can share a reference clock or a master time base, so be sure to check the documentation. So let's talk about sharing a sample clock first. Sample clocks can be located on the device itself or on the back plane of the system. If it's on the back plane, it's pretty easy to configure. You just have to select it in the source for your sample clock, and it should just be on the drop down menu. But if it's on the device, then you'll have to export the signal using an advanced DACMX VI. So for these two USB devices, we actually have to export the clock uh, with a, to a PFI line, and we'll have to use the export signal um, advanced DACMX VI. We'll then have to physically connect both of those USB DAC devices um, with that PFI line. When you share a clock, one device is providing the signal, and then there's the device that uses the signal. So the device that provides the signal, in this case the sample clock, is called the master device. And all other devices in the application that use this signal are called slave devices. So in this example, the master device is the uh, top line, which is AI voltage, and the slave is using that clock source, um, the Dev2 AI sample clock, as its sample clock. To make sure that all devices begin their task at the same time, we have to make sure that the slave device, uh, which is the device that's receiving the clock signal or trigger, is configured and running before the master device begins. Here's a couple of common ways to make sure the slave device task is configured and ready to run by the time the master task starts. In this exercise, we're going to synchronize the analog input acquisition on our CDEC along with the analog output generation using a shared sample clock and hardware trigger. This is the solution walkthrough for exercise 8.2. So I've opened up our uh, solution to exercise 8.2 and I've already hooked up um, the 9215 module, which is in slot 8, with our 9263 module, which is the analog output module, um, in slot 4. And if we just take a look at this block diagram, we can see that the analog input task is first off triggered by the start trigger of the analog output channel, which will just be um, the same one when it started here in the analog output channel. And then the sample clock is sharing, uh, the analog input sample clock is pointed to the analog output sample clock. So they will be sharing the exact same sample clock. And it looks pretty similar to um, using the same start trigger as the analog output channel. The other thing that we changed was uh, changing the DACMX read VI to output uh, waveforms so that it contained a timestamp. So let's go ahead and test this out. I have this set to a thousand. I have both output rates set to a thousand. Um, so I'll start this and then press the hardware trigger. And we got our sample. So, let's clear these data. I'll just right click the chart and then went to data operations and clear graph. And I'll do the same exact thing. But now let's change the input rate to 500. So remember that the analog input channel is sharing the same sample clock as the analog output channel. So if we did that and I press the trigger. 
Now the time says two, but it's the exact same data as we had with the analog output channel. So changing the um, rates didn't really do anything because we're sharing the same sample clock, right? We can't run the acquisition at a different rate. So let's clear these again. Go to data operations, clear graph, data operations, clear graph. And then let's change this back to thousand and then let's change this one to 250 then we'll go ahead and run this and we'll count uh, how many seconds it actually takes to get to uh, the first samples run this press the trigger or Mississippi bam okay so it took four seconds to update this uh, first samples graph, but it only says one second. So the chart is actually displaying inaccurately synchronized data. So let's say we change the output rate to a thousand and the input rate to 2000. What do we think is going to happen? Clear these first. Run this. So the uh, the graph thought we were taking samples twice as fast, but we're still using the same sample clock. So we still have the exact same data, um, and we still have we're still basically using the same um, rate as the analog output channel. So to sum it all up. Um, when we're sharing the sample clock, we can't use different acquisition rates. And that is the end of exercise A2. In this exercise, you modified a simultaneous start VI from a previous exercise so that the tasks shared a sample clock. By sharing a clock and using a hardware trigger, you synchronized the analog output and analog input. We just did an exercise on sharing a sample clock, so now let's compare sharing a reference clock instead. You're familiar with buses such as USB and Ethernet, but not all buses can handle the requirements of routing clock and timing signals. Since we're talking about transferring clock and timing signals between boards and devices, it's important to make sure that we have the right cabling and lines available. Almost all NIDAC devices provide access to Programmable Function Interface Lines, or PFI Lines, that can then be used to route clocks and triggers between different devices. PXI and RITSEQ lines can also transfer clock and timing signals. So for compact DAC, the uh, reference clock and triggers must be routed um, in and out through a PFI line. Uh, but be sure to note that USB devices do not have a synchronization bus. Um, so we must synchronize USB devices with external sample clocks. A reference clock is a clock signal that is referenced by other systems' clocks to derive their own clock signals. So this means that the device's timing has the accuracy and stability of the external clock source. Um, and then again, the derived clocks are multiplied or divided by certain values to then obtain clocks that are slower or faster than the reference clock. Um, different boards may start at different clock edges due to skew and jitter still. So using a reference clock means that the device still might have errors that we need to compensate for. And these errors come from the length of the signal path, the individual board timing, 
and jitter. And so the combination of these factors will cause each board to see and respond to the external signal at different times. Some pros and cons of a using reference clock for synchronization. Uh, the pros, it is the most flexible and powerful method. Um, we can minimize or eliminate skew in clocks because they're basically phase lock looped to the onboard oscillator. We can also allow for different sample rates. Um, because we're using that same clock, we can derive our own sample rate from that. So the cons are that uh, it is hardware specific. So we must have an STC or system timing controller, which is an uh, ASIC designed by NI. And we also can get skew from sharing the start trigger from the master to slaves. Here's how you might implement this in software. We use the property node to specify the reference clock source and also note that we have the ability to compensate uh, with trigger skew correction. Let's finally take a look at sharing a time base. Sharing a master time base allows you to align sample clocks so that they're in phase and driven by the same timing signal. This way they don't drift. As you can see, we have the uh, time base at the very top on the right hand side, and then both of these AI and AO sample clocks are being derived from that time base. And the divisor is kind of, if you follow down the time base to, let's say the analog input, um, the divisor is on the right hand side and it's in the same general location for the analog output sample clock. We'll review a few of the uh, pros and cons of uh, master time based synchronization. So the pros are actually the same as the sample clock synchronization. First off, it allows synchronization across the different types of devices, it uh, prevents the drift, and we can actually use different sampling rates. So the cons uh, are that the slave device uses the imported time base for all clocking done on the card. As well as, um, if that time base is interrupted, it's going to cause erratic behavior. Here's how you might implement this in software. So you use the property node to specify the master time base as you can see in the DACMX timing property nodes. Then in this example, we use the default sample clock time base of the uh, top device to be the sample clock time base of the bottom device. In this exercise, we'll be synchronizing two operations that acquire data at different rates. And to do this, we'll be using a master time base as the clock source. This is the solution walkthrough for exercise 8.3. So I've opened up the solution files um, for the time-based synchronization exercise. And let's take a look at the block diagram. So you can see here that we have a couple different sections. The first one is the uh, channel settings for both the analog input channel and the analog input thermocouple channel. Um, so this, the first channel is just connecting to our light sensor and the other one is just uh, to a thermocouple. So this is our channel settings. Then we have our timing settings set up right here. Then we have our trigger settings. And then finally we get to our while loop where we're reading in all the data. One thing to note is that uh, we don't have a master slave set up here because we're both using the same trigger to begin the task. We have uh, both these triggers set up at the same PFI zero line, which is just the trigger on our DAC demo box. And then to specify the same time base, we use the DACMX property node. And then we can just select the drop down menu here, sample clock, time base, and source. And if we wanted to add an extra node to our property node, we can drag over here and put it back. So when we select the time base, we also have to select the rate, which they're both sharing. 
So let's go ahead and close this out. And I've got this set up for the light sensor, which is uh, the 9215. And then the uh, thermocouple module, which is the 9213. So I'll then start my VI, press the hardware trigger. Then I'll light up the light sensor and press the thermocouple. Same time. So I've got some good data, and then I will stop the graph. Um, so we're collecting these thermocouple rates at the same exact rate as the light sensor, but it's really not changing that fast. So what we could do is just change this to 100. Then I will clear these so I will start my VI press the trigger light up the sensor and get some through a couple readings and maybe let go of it And I can stop my VI. So we have all this data. Let's go ahead and export this to another program. Let's open up Excel. Just open up a blank one. So I'm just going to right click and go to export to the clipboard. Then I will paste what I've got. And I'll right click, export data to clipboard. And let's paste this right here. So you can see that I have a sample at point zero zero one. And then at point zero 0.01, we finally took our first thermocouple reading. So we can see that we have nine extra samples uh, for the light sensor in between every one sample of the thermocouple readings. So indeed, the rates were changed. And that is the end of exercise 8.3. In this exercise, you created an application that sampled two analog input signals at different rates. You synchronized the two C-series modules using a master time base on the backplane of the CDAC chassis. The two modules contained different ADCs. The 9213 used a Delta Sigma ADC with a scanning sampling mode, or slow sample device. The 9215 used an SAR ADC that used successive approximation. After acquiring data, you copied and pasted the data into a spreadsheet and noticed the timestamp comparisons. The synchronization capabilities of a hardware device are very specific to the details of the hardware wiring. We've worked with some of the general methods in the previous lessons, but if you need tight synchronization, you'll need to delve deeper into the timing capabilities of the specific hardware. Just as a quick review, here are the synchronization requirements. First one is we need to share the time base or clocks to avoid drift over time. We then need to use a hardware trigger to start. And finally, we have to start the slave task before the master task. Be sure to check out and bookmark um, all of the white papers that we have on synchronizing. So we have a few, uh, we have the M-series synchronization with LabVIEW and NIDACMX, and then we have the synchronizing analog input C-series modules with NIDACMX. Um, so you can usually find a white paper that talks about your specific hardware and will be really useful for you in the future. We also have the timing and synchronization systems white paper, which just goes into all that a little deeper.
this demonstration, we'll talk about another useful tool for synchronization, which is the uh, LabVIEW synchronization examples included in the example finder. So I'll just start here by, I've got LabVIEW open, I'll just go to help, and then the find examples to get to the example finder. I'll then uh, look in hardware input output. We're using the DACMX drivers, select that. And then I'm looking for an example for synchronization. So obviously I would look in the synchronization folder first. And then um, I'm gonna look at the analog input synchronization VI. So we have our front panel here. And we have the master physical channel, slave physical channel, synchronization type. So this is actually going through all the different uh, device series and how the best way to synchronize them is. So if we go to the block diagram, go to window, show block diagram. Okay, so we have the master channel and a slave channel they right here, they're sharing sample rates. And then here we actually are choosing which series we're using. So we have X series, PCIe, gives a little helpful hint. Um, we're just sharing the refer reference clock using the onboard clock and the clock rates to the slave. And then we're compensating for the trigger skew using uh, the sync type. So we go to the next one, X series and SC Express. Um, we are just using the PXIE clock 100 and the same rate. So the next one, E series, S series, which is just the default. We are sharing the master time base as the source and then to the slave. And there's a quick note here about certain um, cards that have a few caveats. And then M series PCI devices. Again, we're sharing the reference clock source. M series PXI, we're actually um, referencing the PXI clock. So we're sharing the reference clocks for PXI devices. And then we get to our DSA sample clock time base. Um, so we're exporting master time base and sync pulse. And then we're exporting that into our slave task. And here's another example. So in this one, we're actually referencing the uh, peak side clock 10. Some other few notes. And we're back to X series. So be sure to check out this example, um, which refers to some specific hardware. the end of this lesson, so let's do a quick review with a couple questions. Is this application synchronized? And if not, what are the possible errors? In this example, 
is this application synchronized? And if not, what are the possible errors? So, in this lesson, we talked about the appropriate methods for synchronizing multiple DAC tasks. So we covered um, synchronizing a signal device with a shared trigger, synchronizing multiple devices, and finally synchronizing specific hardware series.